The iHemp Hour is brought to you by Down on the Farm. Hemp seed oil, better eggs, better fries, through hemp. Get yours at downofthefarm.biz. Hey, we're live. Hey, we're live. All right, welcome to the iHemp Hour. iHemp Michigan's mission is to educate, inform, and promote the research, development, and cultivation of industrial hemp in Michigan. I have Michigan advocates for wellness in people and the planet through hemp, and it begins with the farmer. On today's episode, we're going to be talking more about some hemp testing. But before we get back to that, let's uh, welcome Mike Brennan back from a little vacation. How's that going, Mike? I was great. I needed some time off, went over to West Michigan, uh, visited family and friends, and disconnected from the internet for several days. So uh, don't do that very often. So yeah, it was great. So uh, as, as you can notice from my uh, sign in the background there, 420 Post is uh, one of our uh, products that we have, a website, cannabis uh, website, focusing primarily on Michigan. So there's some Michigan cannabis news I wanted to share, you know, uh, that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the NCAM index uh, just came out and it showed that in, uh, nationally, that cannabis, legal cannabis consumption in all 50, well, in all 50 states, so 13 states where it's legal, was up 4% in May. So uh, during the pandemic, a lot of people are home and apparently they're consuming cannabis. And uh, uh, so sales are pretty brisk and we've done really, really well here in Michigan as well. I think so far we've sold $200 million worth of cannabis uh, since we went legal in December. Uh, also, a couple other things uh, that the state just announced, uh, Andrew Brispo uh, from the Michigan Regulatory Agency just announced that uh, you won't have to have a medical marijuana license to get a recreational marijuana license. That's changing on November 1st. So if you don't want to sell medical marijuana and just want to sell recreational marijuana, well, then uh, you're allowed to do that after November 1st. At least apply for your license after November 1st. I was and, surprised uh, on the licensing, Mike, that no one's taking, uh, you know, no one's purchased a micro biz, micro grow license. Yeah, I think that's a tricky one. That's where you can have up to 1,500 plants. And, and 150. Um, yeah, is it 150? I thought it was 150 for the okay, year. That's a, yeah, I... Hey, you do the math, you know, it could be a nice small little business for somebody, but I was just, I'm surprised no one. Yeah, as far as I know, no, I just looked at those stats myself and uh, I was trying to figure that out why no one's moving on that. And uh, I don't know whether there's legal issues or financial issues, but yeah, there hasn't been yeah. much action in that area. What you're seeing here in the state is a lot of uh, bigger operations that are running the yeah. recreational space. And a lot of multi-state operators have come in but you also have some big operations in the state that are planning to open up to 20 stores over the next year or so. Um, so a significant amount of money. Then you yeah. also have some big grow operations. Common Citizen over in Marshall's got, I think about 150,000 square foot in a real greenhouse setting, you know, with glass versus the more traditional warehouse kind of setting. And uh, they're up and running. And then there's a couple other big operations that are going, but, you know, you're in, when you're 150,000 square foot, you're into a lot of dollars there. So uh, uh, the, right now, that's where the industry is. I think as we begin to move forward, and there's a lot of licenses pending. There's hundreds of licenses pending. Um, and, and even people that have licenses, none of them haven't moved forward on whatever it is they plan to do. Uh, so I think we're looking at next year before the market kind of settles down a bit and uh, and, and there's more competition and probably prices will come down. Um, but uh, yeah, it, we're still a top three or four state in the country for illegal cannabis sales. Uh, and so uh, it's doing, Michigan's doing quite well in that area. So mm -hmm. that's, that's about all I have. So we'll turn it over to Blaine here. You got something, Blaine? I do. I hope everybody can hear me all right. Just wanted to remind you of our mask uh, donation for fun drive that we have going on. Um, these are really comfortable hemp masks. Uh, we donated 200 of them to the state for that they could use them. We hope that they went to the agricultural inspectors. That was the idea with them, but we couldn't really direct them exactly where. So, uh, but these are really comfortable. Um, and um, so with the information's on the website, 
you can buy a mask, you can buy a mask and uh, a little bit more, you get a t-shirt with it. So we appreciate it. We had a, uh, give a shout out to Richard. He uh, helped us out there with donations for that. So um, help us uh, cover that cost to be able to do that and help keep our frontline people working and safe out there. So uh, let's see, a lot of stuff's kind of come down this last week. Um, we talked a little bit last week about that salmonella outbreak and we didn't know where it was coming from. Well, they figured right out onion, where it was huh? coming from. It was from uh, Thompson International Red Onions, but they've called back all the Thompsonville onions. So um, if you haven't uh, checked your label, if you have them at home, um, check with your store. Um, I didn't find any in my inventory that I had, but so that's where the problem seemed to come from, from uh, these Thompsonville red onions and also all, the, all, all their other onions are calling back as well. Uh, if you need more information on that, if you just, I'm sure if you just Google in or type in the uh, red onion salamelia outbreak, it'll show there and then also list, they do have pictures of all the other labels that these were sold under through Thompsonville, but under other labels, so. Uh, the unsolicited seed from China, I don't know if people are still receiving that or not, but if you do or are to have them, uh, they wanna make sure that you contact USDA on that, get those seeds returned. Um, hopefully you did not plant them. Uh, if you did, of course, then they'll talk to you about that and how to get them back out of the ground so we make sure that we're not putting something that we have no idea what it is in those packages that came in from China, so. Can I, can I stop you on that, Blaine? Sure, I've been absolutely. reading those stories and everyone's trying to figure out what's going on with that. I mean, have you figured that part out or what have you heard? You know, the only thing I've heard is what I've read in some of the releases that somehow it's a way for them to small, ship small packages into the United States and get uh, positive reviews on their websites or their products that they're carrying. Huh. Uh, so that sounds a little strange to me. I don't know if anybody else has any more information online here, but if you do speak up, put it in the chat or something, it'd be great to share that. But that's the most I've heard on it. I, I don't know. And it isn't all, it isn't just one kind of seed. Like it's not like a soybean seed or something like that. It seems to be a variety of different sizes and kinds and stuff like that. So, but uh, do not know what they are. Mm -hmm. Um. No word yet on the assistance for the under the CFAP program uh, for uh, hemp growers. Uh, hopefully, we'll hear something on that soon. But we haven't. But uh, Congress, all of our Congress representatives are going to be home here in the next week or so, or for a month. And uh, we're going to next week's show. We're going to talk a lot about that. We've invited some people to come on the show about how we can reach out to our representatives, why they're home, uh, why they're uh, campaigning right now. Um, about getting some of the rules changed that we have uh, to make the industry more um, better for growing, uh, increasing the THC level, the 15 days for the uh, harvest. So a lot of issues there that we have a good chance of talking about the representatives while they're home. So we'll talk more about that on next week's show, but uh, that's a big thing that we need. We can take a great advantage of right now while people are home. Uh, it's National Farmers Week this week, uh, the 2nd through the 8th. So if you get the chance, if you're a regular farmer's market, maybe tell those farmers thanks for what they do. If not, maybe go down and try to get something this weekend if they're around. Or during the week if your your city or area happens to have it during the week. The uh, I have Midwest uh, Expo is a go. Uh, we have decided to commit to doing this. Um, it's going to be Friday, January 22nd and Saturday, January 23rd, 2001. If we can hold a live event, which that is our plan right now, and that's where we're going forward with it, it will be at the Lansing Center, as we did last year. Uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers that we're developing right now. Uh, and I believe our theme and our mantra for this is going to be a sustainable world. If I said that right, Dave, right? Yes, sir. So if we have to go virtual, we have a background, we have a backup for that. So, it, so we go virtual, we will. Um, we'll have a lot more uh, information and registration will start in October. So just uh, kind of keep forward for that. The other big news that came down this week was a edict uh, memorandum, uh, a uh, executive uh, emergency order, let's call it that, because that's what it was, uh, regarding testing on agricultural farms. Now there's only certain people that have to do this, uh, according to the order here. Um, so if you have a migrant housing camp operation, then you have to do some certain things. And if you are um, a 
an employer of migrant or seasonal workers, meat, poultry, and egg processing facilities and greenhouses. Um, so those are the facilities that have to have. There's going to be, Farm Bureau is going to be hosting a webinar today at three o'clock. Um, I'm going to sit down and get a little more information. Uh, but this is another way that they're trying to help prevent and the spread of the COVID and uh, mandatory information they're doing. And hopefully there'll be some more uh, assistance for these farmers that have to do this to help cover the cost of this. This is a huge cost. Um, these tests uh, will run anywhere from you know, 100 bucks up to 165 uh, the toll. And um, I don't know if any of the insurance, insurance covers it or not, but I'm sure there'll be some information on this webinar today that'll help everybody understand and answer a lot of questions for that, so. Hey, Blaine, uh, I think there's a criteria on that is that, that the uh, facility has to be 25 employees or more if it's a uh, meat processing facility or uh, along those lines. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's 20 or more. Yeah, 20 or more employees. Smaller facilities would be exempt from that. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. Uh, All right, so at the end of the show, we'll have a recipe. Uh, also, I'm just going to make an announcement now um, that if anybody was growing hemp for grain that you know out there, um, I would be interested in talking with them about maybe buying their grain this fall. Um, we'll have more information on that a little later. So, all right, so that's about it. Dave, you want to take it away and introduce Scott? Or well, I'll, Scott? I'll let you introduce Scott if that's okay, Blaine. You got some, I can do that. All right. If you have the information, since you've been speaking. I do, yep. Yeah. Mm hmm and I'll let Scott fill in all the holes that I'll make on him. So, <laughs> so Scott was on our show a few weeks back. Um, we were talking about testing. And Scott, uh, New Age Laboratories out of South Haven, Michigan is where they're out of. So local boy, yep. shout out for that. Um, and he's going to give us a lot more detail than we were able to cover on the show that day about SAP analysis. This is where you take tissue of the plant and they actually... Um, uh, break it down to where the plant is for his nutrient guide and other stuff that he's going to share with us on that. So we're pleased to talk with him then and we're pleased to have him on the show today. So Scott, I'll kind of let maybe you give a little bit more of your background and we do, Dave, did you get the... I have, yeah, I have that queued up, ready to go. Okay, so um, what we can do, Scott, is um, the information you sent me, Dave has, and he can put that up when we get to those talking about cost and word. other things, so... Fantastic. Good. So we'll, we'll work into that and, uh, you know, kind of broaden it out. Um, you know, new, so New Age, uh, we've been uh, a certified laboratory since the late 90s. Uh, we actually um, uh, originated as a uh, environmental laboratory and our niche market was that we, uh, we had mobile laboratories and we did a lot of work for the EPA uh, the Department of Defense and NASA, and uh, it's a the environmental industry is kind of a uh, a boom and bust uh, market. Uh, so uh, the fact that we were located in West Michigan and had a lot of agricultural uh, neighbors, uh, we uh, expanded the laboratory into servicing the uh, agricultural and food safety uh, industries. Um, so that broadened out our market. Um, quite a bit and that's what brought us into um, also now servicing the hemp and cannabis industries not only here in Michigan but uh, nationwide um, so you know we have one of the, a, a great advantage is that we look at the um, any of our industries whether it's the hemp, uh, hemp or let's just call it the cannabis species industries uh, we look at it from um, a soil seed all the way to finished product kind of process. Uh, we're not looking at any one segment. We want to facilitate the grow facilities and the uh, processing facilities from start to finish. Um, so we're not, uh, we are not yet licensed as a safety compliance laboratory here in the state of Michigan for cannabis but we're in the process of doing that. Uh, so that would be the finishing touch on our service line for the cannabis industry here in Michigan, where we can do everything from the agricultural and horticultural side of things 
through monitoring and testing soil medias and water for uh, potential contaminants of heavy metals, pesticides, those types of things to prevent, to actually do preventative assessments. Um, you know, a, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, you know, we don't want to get all the way to a finished product and end up with uh, throwing away pounds of finished uh, flour that, uh, that can't met, pass criteria. Uh, and then helping individuals that are um, maybe working it into an edible from a food safety standpoint. So we can take this all the way from start to finish. But to focus in on what we're talking about today, uh, which is plant nutrition, uh, one of the most dynamic tools that we have today, uh, and it's new for, I would say it's new in general for the agricultural and horticultural uh, community, not just cannabis in general, is uh, plant sap analysis. And plant sap analysis is Probably the best way to, to, uh, to make an analogy of this is if you were to go to a doctor and they want to assess what your, your health condition is that day, you're complaining about not feeling well, the first thing the doctor asks you to do is to go, over, uh, to go get a blood draw and they want to do a blood panel. And they assess your health based off of the chemistry and the, and the, and the biophysics within that blood panel. Um, what we've been doing in horticulture and uh, agriculture is we've been doing um, something similar to uh, the doctor asking you to go to the hospital and cut off a finger and then drying that finger out and ashing it and looking at the elemental content of the whole solid tissue and then trying to assess today's health condition and nutrient condition based off of everything that went into constructing that physical tissue and most people cannot make uh, good nutritional management decisions based off of dry tissue analysis but sap analysis sap analysis is where we take the the fan leaf in, in hemp or cannabis we're taking the fan leaf a sampling of the fan leaves across the grow. We're extracting the sap from the, those fan leaves. So we're looking at the both the, the, the xylem and the phloem within the leaf. So there's two different types of sap that come up into the leaves. We're extracting that. And then what we are doing is we're looking at the, the nutritional uh, profile within that sap. So we're looking at about 24 different parameters, uh, both uh, macro and micronutrients and some biophysic uh, type uh, parameters such as sugar production, bricks, pH, um, and the conversion of nitrates into total nitrogen or, or complex uh, molecules like proteins and carbohydrates and that type of thing. Let's see if Dave can bring up that screen. Dave, can you bring up that screen? Okay, so um, that's the sampling guide. Yep. Is it on the PDF? It is. It, was, sent. it would have been something that Lane sent over to you. It wouldn't have been in what I sent you this, this few minutes ago. Oh, I didn't see that. Is this what? There, yep, that's the one. Yep. Mm -hmm. So this is the sampling guide uh, on how to take a proper sample. So on, uh, on any cannabis species, uh, a, <clears throat> what we want to do is we want to collect two, two types of samples from each grow, uh, grow across a variety. We're looking at new growth, which would be collected from the fifth growth point down from the apical uh, tip of the, of the growth. So you're coming from the apical point down to the fifth growth node. It should be a fully formed adult leaf in full photosynthesis. That's, that's why we need to have it a full adult leaf. And you want to sample it so that it includes the petiole. You can see that the 
circle on the uh, right side of your screen includes the petiole in the, that, that would be a proper sample of an individual leaf. A good sample for new and old tissue, we would collect uh, roughly 60 of those, 60 new and 60 old, and then put those samples into Ziploc bags, separate Ziploc bags, that makes a sample pair for that growth in that variety. And then we're gonna compare the sap between the new growth and the old growth to, deter to show how the plant is um, utilizing nutrients and how, what the uptake um, situation is for that plant or that grow at that time uh, on that day. And then we do this about every two weeks across the, across the grow, um, uh, across the grow. So Scott, when would you start doing this then? Probably a few weeks ago? Um, we, usually, we usually start about, uh, well, if you're transplanting, you need to wait till your plants are about 12 inches tall because you, you need a vertical distance between new and old growth uh, for distribution. Plus you want at least two weeks after transplant to allow the plants to, um, to acclimate. You can, if you don't have the vertical growth, you can do a new growth, a new growth sample and couple that with a soil sample. And then what that allows us to do is to look at nutrients in the soil and the uptake into the tissue. And that's a, that would be a C6 is our, is our code. That's a quick soil and sap analysis. And that, so that kind of shows us what we have in the tank in the soil and what's being taken up by the plant. Um, How you know, about so indoor grows if they're doing um, hydroponics and things like that? So the great thing there is that uh, instead of doing the soil, what we're doing there is um, with our uh, cannabis, particularly our, our, our big cannabis grows, we're doing uh, new growth, old growth, and then we'll couple that with a fertigation or feed line uh, analysis. So we, we know what they're delivering, what the plants are taking up, and if they have drain lines, you couple in, a, you bring in a drain line analysis because then you can see what the plants um, are not taking up and how you can dial back those nutrients to um, basically adjust your um, your cost is you're not throwing away nutrients into waste, you know, basically into the waste uh, and having to dispose of uh, excess nutrients. Well, nutrients is a big cost, that's for sure. It is, yeah, absolutely. Scott? Yes, sir. Could, could you just go over, where the, we say here, uh, fifth from the growing tip, is that, is that considered the new growth? Yes, that would be your new growth sample. And, and where then, do you, where do you grab the old growth from? Farther down, right? Or like, so the old growth, you'd go all the way to the bottom of the plant. All the way to the bottom, okay. And take the, the oldest, still viable uh, leaves at, from the bottom of the plant. It so how many leaves? Browning, you wouldn't take those? Right. No, you, you would not, unless you, in, you know, unless you had a section of the field that you have some type of um, uh, disorder or disease that you want to assess and then in that case you I would recommend that you take samples specifically from those plants to compare to where you're having good success so that we can look at the dis you know what's going what's the differential between the good locations and the bad locations so Thank you. Uh, you typically what if you're looking at um, at browning at the bottom or discoloring at the bottom, it's usually a mobile nutrient that is being scavenged out of those leaves um, to feed new growth because you don't have, you have insufficient uptake from the soil. So <clears throat> if you wanna go to, Dave, I think I sent you uh, some PDFs here probably about 15 minutes ago or so. Okay, let me take a look. Uh, go ahead and uh, sure. what, what are we looking for? So you should have a uh, you should have an email from me. Uh, it was a reply to the link for today's show, and I attached um, 
I attached four PDFs. Uh, two of them will be uh, staff examples. Got it. One's going to be for June and one's going to be for July. These are from the same grow, same variety. Um, but this will show, this is a differential SAP report and it has a couple of pieces of information that we'll show on both of these. <clears throat> uh, so what we're, so what we're going to do on these analyses is we're going to look at uh, particularly mobile nutrients. Uh, mobile nutrients uh, are nutrients where the plant will uh, optimize uh, the concentration in new growth. If it has excess uptake of those nutrients, it will shunt the uh, excess nutrient into old tissue. If it has, does not have enough uptake of, of these mobile nutrients, it will scavenge uh, nutrients from the old tissue to feed the new growth. So on this particular sample, so this is, this is a, a cannabis um, sap analysis. And what you're looking at here, this is the July one. Do you have the, do you have the other one, Dave, that you put up first? There we go. Okay, so here's, here's the grow at, uh, in June on the 22nd. Um, the light colored bars represent new growth. The dark colored bars represent old growth. So, and the concentrations are listed on the left hand side. The optimal ranges that we've determined are, are, should be between the two black lines. Now, not every variety falls in there. But what you can see here is in for this variety on June 22nd, sulfur, phosphorus, potassium, all of these are mobile nutrients. They're not the only ones, but those three particularly I just highlighted. These are mobile nutrients. They have, the plant is having sufficient uptake of these nutrients. It has more than it needs. So it's shunting the excess to the, to the old tissue. So you, see, so you see the dark bar is, is, is farther to the right than the, the new tissue. So that shows, that shows you that you have more uptake than the plant needs at that time in the new growth. So do you have to adjust the fertilizer or how do you compensate for that? You, you can you could adjust your fertilizer back that would you know if you continually stay at that level you would want to adjust your feed back if, if you had a fertigation program um, that gave you that flexibility if you were doing a soil program uh, and therefore you had already applied the nutrients over the in the beginning of the year what we want to do is look at the nutrient use throughout the whole grow and then you might have to make an adjustment. You, you basically learn from that for next, for the next planting to adjust your management for the next grow. Um, now here in the, what you're showing there now are trace elements. Most of your trace elements or your micros are either moderately or not mobile at all. So these we want to shoot for trying to get these into the, that optimal range. Um, the, the key micronutrients that uh, lead, that, that are important to uh, plant and crop success, uh, boron, boron is, is important for uh, calcium uptake. Uh, hemp or cannabis is extremely uh, dependent upon good calcium. Uh, heavy on, it's heavy on fiber production, so it requires a lot of calcium for mm. strong cells. Uh, without proper boron, you'll have, a, you'll have a tendency to not be able to take up the calcium that's necessary. Um, cobalt and copper tend to be associated mo more with uh, disease and, and pest resistance, um, so those are more of a health issue. Iron and and manganese, uh, these are uh, elements that are particularly important for good photosynthesis. Uh, 
they tend to come into play with water hydrolysis uh, in, that's involved in um, photosynthesis. So without adequate levels here, you're hindering your crop uh, or your plants from reaching their potential um, of producing sugars, uh, resins, you know, THCAs, CBDAs, CBGAs, those types of things. Um, iron, particularly in photosynthesis, manganese. Uh, the manganese is your regulator of potassium. So uh, we know that potassium is very important for most plants. It regulates the uptake of potassium. Uh, so it's key to have good and adequate levels of potassium. Uh, zinc uh, is uh, key for uptake of phosphorus. So as you get um, throughout the entire grow, uh, your root development is dependent upon phosphorus. That's a, you know, root development is a reproductive um, uh, function. And then flowering. So without, uh, without adequate zinc um, and proper, uh, you'll, you'll tend to under, um, you'll hinder the uptake of phosphorus. Uh, so proper zinc uh, concentrations are very critical. Hmm. And then at the very bottom there, we start looking at the nitrogen, the forms of nitrogen, and then how the plant is converted, how well the plant is converting nitri uh, nitrates and ammonias into total nitrogen. So your total nitrogen represents how the plant is converting nitrates and ammonias into complex molecules, proteins, carbohydrates, sugars, uh, all, these, all these very critical structures that, um, that are long lasting. Uh, nitrate and ammonia are short term, but if the plant isn't converting them over and they re they're retained in the sap um, in the 24-hour photosynthesis cycle, they become a target for sap-sucking pests, aphids, thrips, mites. Uh, so we look at this and we want to see nitrogen as nitrate less than, uh, as le we'd love to see it, you know, almost zero relative to total nitrogen. Uh, but as it climbs up and becomes a ratio closer to 50% of your total nitrogen, your risk of aphids and sap sucking pests increase. And, and so, you know, that, that, that's a critical fa uh, indicator for us to always monitor on grows uh, and how, what their susceptibility is going to be to pests. So is this nitrogen that we're seeing here on this test, is that way past the optimum range on that then? Um, it, it is showing that it is, um, it's, it's well past sufficient, what we would call a, an optimal level or sufficiency level. And you can see that the, the, the dark, uh, the older tissue has more, uh, it, it's shunting nitrogen into the old tissue. This grow could probably be just fine with less, with less nitrogen, but it's converting it over it's converting it over well. They could probably dial back nitrogen a little bit. Now, if you, David, so that's, this is, so you kind of keep this one in mind. Now here's that same grow. Um, so it was, that was the 22nd, this is the sixth. So two weeks later, where we were sufficient with phosphorus, sulfur, potassium, you now see that the plant that the grow is starting has started to utilize those excesses and is now in a deficient state. It's it's now used up its its um, surplus. And when we look at these numbers, what we want to we take a look at the uh, the new versus the old. If we have a differential there of more than twenty percent we consider the, the plant in a deficient state for that nutrient. So under phosphorus there, the new is at 120, the 
uh, the new is at 160, the old is at 120, were greater than 20% different. So we would consider this grow variety in a deficient state of uptake for phosphorus. Um, now, a, a good friend of mine, Gary Redding, who you had on a couple, a couple of weeks ago that, that I joined with you guys and listened in, Gary taught me a lot, uh, very carefully to, to watch my verbiage because I would, uh, he, 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 uh, I used to say that it was deficient and that somebody was not applying enough phosphorus and that may not be true. Uh, so we always refer to it now as uptake that something is hindering, there could be something other than the presence of or lack of that nutrient that is, in, so, that is hindering the uptake. Right, so just by putting more phosphorus on doesn't mean the plant's gonna take it out. Yeah, you're saying right. zinc, zinc uh, helps in that uptake? That's correct. And then sometimes it's just, it could be not, not in this particular case, but each of these categories, if you look at the anions there, um, some of, if, if you're familiar with the molar charts, how we look at balance within soils, balance within sap is also, also takes place. So if you consider that within the plant, we have a bucket that can hold 100 pieces of anion. There's a, there's a, has to be a balance of percentages or a balance between the different anions. And if we get us, if we get too much of any one, it can hinder the uptake of another. So if we have too much chloride, we could hinder the uptake of phosphorus. Um, we see that in the, cal in the cation. If we have uh, a surplus of potassium or magnesium, we can have a deficiency of calcium because we're hindering the, up the, the plant's ability to take up the calcium because we have a surplus or a hyper aggregation of these other cations. So sometimes it can be a, a micronutrient that is hindering the, the uptake. It can also be an imbalance within the plant that causes the uptake, or it can be what the presence of those nutrients are in the soil. It could be microbiology. And see, this is the this is the beauty of, of, of plant sap analysis, is that it, it, it's a report card on the final, on where we wanna go. You know, we're looking at how is it, how are all these nutrients and all these environmental factors and biological factors that go from, here we put the nutrient in the soil to how does it get to our plant? There's probably, incalculable number of factors that go into uptake and nutrient availability. We can't identify all of them, but we can see where it's getting, how it's affecting getting into the plant. I um, was really surprised when uh, we were talking about this before and how fast it can be t detected in the top of the plant when you put it, you know, add a nutrient into the soil. Is it, is it, it's really quick, the effect, isn't it? It can be. Uh, certain certain elements, um, certain elements are like um, they're like candy to plants. Uh, so uh, potassium and and nitrates, uh, the plants will take up those two elements um, readily over others. Um, whereas some nutrients take phosphorus, for instance. Phosphorus is a little bit harder to get into the plants. Calcium is much harder to get in the plants. You have to think about the fact that those two elements, phosphorus as an anion and calcium as a cation, are the two largest molecules we're trying to move into the plant. If we can get phosphorus and calcium right, the rest, the rest of these elements tend to help, can, can balance out a little bit easier. But these are the largest molecules in those two categories that we're trying to move into the plant and get situated where we want them. Are you using a spectrum? I've got, got a question. Uh, what equipment is used to do a SAP analysis? And well, uh, I'll, I, mean, I, I can, I'll I can, ask Richard. Richard, do you mean by what we use in the field to collect it or what 
he uses at the home, he uses to do the testing. Probably chromatography or spectrum analysis. What, what, what do you? I think that's what Richard's probably asking. Yeah, yeah, I think the lab equipment. So it's a kind of a broad, Richard, it's a kind of a broad, um, there's a broad answer there. Um, over the history of SAP analysis, there are some meters out there, like the Cardi meters and Lamont, where you can do some SAP analysis in the field that they do um, single elements. So if you wanted to follow, if you wanted to look at your potassium, you could actually try to you could actually try to press uh, sap out of leaves and get a drop onto these cardi meters and you'd get a potassium reading. And that's not a bad thing to do on a day-to-day -day look. Uh, what I would recommend, um, because I've done a lot of work with field instruments, both environmentally and for agriculture, is those kind of tools are great for you to use on a day-in, day-out basis. And then tie in something like the lab sap analysis every two weeks to say, okay, how are we correlating, and how does how can I spread this over, uh, tie in my data with the lab data, and really make management decisions based off of what's going on. Uh, now, as far as the instruments that we use here, we're using everything from ICP, ICPMS. Uh, gas chromatographs, uh, direct analyzers, um, thermal conductivity detectors. Uh, so it, it's a really a broad spectrum depending on which element and which parameter we're trying to to to, uh, to analyze and get turn uh, get out uh, for the analysis. Can I weigh in a little bit here? I'm the non-farmer in the group, so I have some questions. Um, how you were saying that the zap test should be done every other week or so for optimal performance? That is correct. Yep. Okay. Then one of the things is cost. What does something like that cost? I'm sure everybody would want to know that. Sure. So if, um, uh, if you pay, so we have the two, we have kind of two programs. So if anybody wanted to send in a pair, uh, it's $75 for a pair. So if a pair, a pair, Scott, is an old, the old and new growth. That's right? correct. Yep. Okay. Now, if you become, if you be, if you join what we call our prepay program for members, then which means you have to buy ten, a minimum of ten pairs ahead of time, you get a twenty percent discount off of that, and sure. they go down to sixty dollars a pair. Then but, let, me, let me ask another question too. And again, yeah. I'm a non-farmer, so this may be a stupid question, but uh, if you have a sizable field would there be any variation in your plants from one part of the field to another part of the field? And would you have to do different testing for different parts of the field? There can be variation across the field. So you do want to take, you want to take your, when you're collecting those 60 leaves, you want to collect those leaves across an area that you feel represents the total management of the field and the quality of the field. We try to say, Try to collect no more than three leaves from any one plant. Um, and if you can do, you know, usually what I'll do is I'll take uh, 10 locations throughout the field or throughout an area that I think represents the quality of the field and the management of the field. I find 10 locations. In, that lo in each location, I try to select six new leaves and six old leaves and no more than three from any one plant. So if I get two from one and two from the one next to it and two from the one on the other side, then I can move to another location. And I've got, now I've got six new and six old from that location. And now I've got a, a sampling program that should take out my, trying to remove my bias and not, and, and that's the key, uh, you know, with any research or any uh, sampling, is remove your bot, try to remove your bias in your sampling program and um, and quality in, quality out. So if you collect a crappy sample, you're gonna get crappy data. Uh, so bad data in, bad data out, right. That's so, right. Uh, you know, you know what we're looking at here is is sap uptake into the plant and photosynthesis. 
So you want to collect the sample between uh, sunrise and no later than about 11 o'clock in the, in the morning. You know, we're talking out, outdoor. Um, right. Indoor grows can be a little bit different. Um, and you want to try to do this on a sunny day, on sunny days. If you, if you do it on cold, rainy days, your photosynthesis is not going to be the same. Your uptake's not the same. Uh, so you want to be consistent with how you collect the sample time after time so that you can look at trend lines. Right. And uh, Dave, if you show that uh, the, the next two were trend lines for these for this particular grow. Um, so you can see oh, that, oh, the other uh, trend line. Yeah. Let's see. Are there different dates on these? And we, um, we have another question too. Uh, yeah. Kim on Facebook asked, about the plastic bags we've been told by some that you only use paper bags that you know. is for, that's for dry tissue analysis uh so if you do dry tissue analysis they want to dry the sample out okay for sap analysis we want the sample to retain the moisture but we don't want wet samples so uh what you're going to do is you're going to take your 50 or you're going to take your 60 samples uh roughly 80 grams of sample. You're gonna take those leaves, you're gonna slide them into a Ziploc bag. You're gonna express all the air out of the bag so that you eliminate the possibility of those leaves continuing to respire and then seal it up. Okay. Um, and then with, with any kind of cannabis, whether it's hemp or, or not, put those Ziploc bags inside another Ziploc bag before you ship it. Okay. Because they all, they're all aromatic and it just it just mitigates having any kind of issues with uh, the postal system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. let, let me one final question: What's the turnaround time? Do you recommend people overnight the stuff to you, and then if so, or not, or and then how long does it take you to test it? Uh, we do recommend overnight, uh, and we turn all the results in 24 hours. What? Oh wow! Because it's only good. I mean, we're we're talking about yeah. that's the data today, so we want to get the data back to you make the the information um usable it needs to be something actionable that you can make a decisions on day in day out mm -hmm. so uh you know if, if the data is five six days old you're now six seven days behind where the plant uh, was when you took those samples and that doesn't do you any good so yeah so when you say 80 grams that's almost three ounces yep plant material Yep. Yep. Yeah, and you, no, you need you need that much to get a, a good enough sample out of it. Yeah, to get the to get the sap right because we remember we're not we're not grinding the sample we're not freezing the sample so we have to be able to extract the sap from the vascular tissue. We don't want to rupture cells. Uh, we're extracting sample only from vascular tissue because if we start rupturing cells, now we're looking at what's in the in the vacuoles of the individual epidural cells and mesophyll cells. And we don't want to be looking at that. We want to look at what's being fed in and out of the leaf. Whoa. Hmm. Okay. So these two uh, graphs that you're looking at, this one right here. So this is a five week period for this grow. And this is, we're look, particularly we're looking at phosphorus and this is the old tissue. So you can see the old tissue has a, a Thrown in a trend line here. The optimal levels are at are the yellow and the and the red, oh, and okay. and then the actual data points and then a trend line. Now the goal we're we're working on this uh, along with um, Jenny Garley, who is my chief science officer, and uh, hopefully Gary's gonna Gary Redding's gonna be joining us with this. We're we're talking about negotiating how he's gonna join in with us to develop a platform to uh, fine tune these, this type of graphing so that growers can, uh, we're, we're actually gonna take these two graphs and overlay them so that you get new and old data um, on the same graph because that's really, um, it's really meaningful. It, it shows you what's going on and, and where you may, may have made decisions and where the plant's switching from uh, uh, having surplus to being in deficient position 
and you can tie these types of trend lines in with what you were doing management wise on a time scale. Scott, have you been able to, over the research you've been doing, have you been able to also collate this to timing of what the plant is doing? In other words, when it's going to vegetative and now all of a sudden, now it's gonna to go to making the flower. Um, yes. and now it's gonna to go to maturing. Right, yeah, we do have, we do have different, a different look at the nutrients from veg to uh, flowering. Um, and then what we're now currently uh, working on, I'm not ready to, to fully market it yet uh, because I, A, I don't have the staffing to really handle it because I think it's going to be very, very popular, is that we're actually doing the same thing. Let's say we were looking, graphing this phosphorus. We're now looking at, in within these SAP samples, uh, we're now analyzing the SAP for THCA, CBDA, CBGA, and CBDN, CBNA. So we're looking at the acids within the sap that will then convert, you know, over into your THC, CBG, CBDs. Um, How early do you see that in the uh, in the fan leaves? Well, uh, you know, we the lowest we can see right now is 10 ppm in concentration, um, and we've seen it as young as four weeks in veg. So I have a question for you. So like this morning I made a smoothie and I put hemp leaves in it, you know, part of my smoothie is, am I getting some health guy. benefit? I mean, it, it just is cool, right? I've got to trim yeah. the plants anyhow. Um, is, are, You're am probably I, getting some, but probably not enough that, uh, I mean, remember we're, we're pressing. So we analyze, uh, I think the highest I've seen uh, and this is going to be the acid form. It's not going to be, it's not going to be carboxylated unless you heat it up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be the acid form because it only exists in the sap in the acid form. Um, so I've seen THCA as high as, uh, uh, I think 3,500 PPM. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, doing a conversion over to uh, dry matter, um, assuming that dry uh, that plants are 20% uh, moisture, um, divide that by 0.2, so you'd probably be somewhere around oh, 1% maybe. You are getting your roughage though, Dave, and that's important. Well, yeah, it's greens, right? So I, some kind of, I, was, I wasn't looking for, I didn't expect any cannabinoids, but I thought there'd be some kind of nutritional value yeah. there, right? The amount of sap in the little bit that you put in there probably isn't enough to get it. But yeah, there's, some, I mean, there's, there's definitely some. My poor neighbor, she's going through chemo and I made her eat a bunch of CBG hemp, you know, um, it, it, and she it wasn't a... It wasn't, I put too much in. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a great shake. I'm working on that. That'll be a, a little bit on the gritty side. Huh? I'll have to work yeah. on that one. Okay, I'll work on that one. But Scott, we've got a couple other questions uh, from Richard. If you take six old and six new samples, do you commingle them? Um, so when you want the pairs, do the pairs yeah. go in the same bag or they go separate bag? Separate bag. Oh, together, right? Old and new, separate. Yeah, if you're, well, if you're doing it across one particular grow, and they're all the same variety. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest you. Um, I don't. I don't want you to spend more money with me than you actually have to. You know, we're all about return on investment for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so if it's all the same grow and you're not and you're not managing it any different, and it's all the same variety, we're going to do one pair, one sample of new, one sample of old, sixty leaves in the new, sixty leaves in the old. I think what he was saying is six six in each of those 10 locations, that would all be commingled into one sample for new and commingled into one sample for old okay. across a variety. Um, also, I guess uh, labeling, uh, how would you want these folks to label this stuff? Do you supply the labels? Do they create their own or what? Nope, they can just write it directly onto the Ziploc bag. And plus there's also a sample submission form. Uh, what we would like you guys to do or what we'd like growers to do. Ah, thank you, thank yep. you, Blaine. There you go. Um, we love if you guys start, uh, the more information you can send with the samples, 
the, the more robust the database becomes. So including things like uh, what your varieties are, um, what growth stage, you, stage you know, what growth stage you feel it's in, um, how do you rate the vigor of the plants on a scale of one to 10 uh, or poor, fair, average, good, excellent is at least something. These, all these things start lending to the fact that we start building a database um, that support us fine tuning optimal levels. Um, these optimal levels are not ever going to be set in stone because the more we learn, the more we keep, um, we keep tweaking them. Um, so. Um, so I got another question from uh, Richard. How many labs across the U.S. are doing the SAP analysis? Uh, two that I know of. <clears throat> you and one other one. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, really appreciate it, Scott. Good intel. It's like a little class we put on today. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I learned, I understood part of it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty much a deep dive there, I'll tell you. So. Yeah. Well, hopefully we didn't put anybody to sleep. So. Not at all. No, it's fascinating. I love it. We've had a, we had a good group on here today. Any other questions, keep sending them in. And if we don't get them answered now, we'll, we'll get them answered after the show and get them back. And we can do that too. So. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. I appreciate you having me on. Okay. You're very welcome. Is it time for the emperor? It's, it's, it's really close to that. We're working on that. Yes, we are. So. Uh, this week, um, and for a future show, I, well, for future shows, um, we're going to talk about manufacturing and what products we're being made out of this stuff. Um, and I'm going to try to show this as best I can. So this is the hemp flooring uh -huh. that's being made down in Kentucky. This is, uh, they have two different uh, stains, uh, seal, sealer they put on them. One's uh -huh. kind of a light color, one kind of a dark color. Um, this is how it comes all natural. And you can put your stain on it if you'd like, that kind of thing. So uh, um, again, we're going to have them on the show at some point in time to talk about manufacturing and what they're doing there. But just to let you know, this is available. This runs um, around $11 a square foot. Um, uh, with it stained, unstained, it's $9 a square foot is what it costs. So um, oh, so uses are coming and... and, and uh, and manufacturers coming and there's a practical knowledge right there of what you can do and use it on come in your home for sure all right so uh we are looking I'll just let you know that we are looking for sponsors to help with with the show keep the lights on that kind of thing this month uh down on the farm is uh my company is sponsoring because i finally was able to manufacture and get my hemp oil made Ooh. So this is actually from the seed that I grew last year. Um, we have a company here in Michigan that's actually doing the processing for us. And uh, so that's what it is there. Uh, the first uh, run that we did of uh, 60 bottles is already gone, but we'll have more coming next week. So, um, so uh, for this week's recipe, a really simple one. For those of you that kind of like this kind of thing, I do every once in a while. Uh, we're going to take the uh, hemp seed oil. And we're going to take a little bit of whatever your flavor, favorite mix might be. This happens to be a, a lemon dill dip mix. And we just put a little bit of that in the dish, and I'll show this in a second, maybe. Let me do that. This is an original recipe, by the way. Uh -huh. I'm not borrowing this from anybody else. And we're just going to take a little bit of the hemp oil. We're going to mix it in with that little bit of, a little bit of flavoring. And then you take your favorite bread. So we're breaking bread. It is lunchtime. Oh, uh, I see. It's a dip. Yep. So it's, it's, it's a little dip. Yeah. Ah. So oh, yeah. trying to do this without oh. spilling the oil. Well, that's a great idea. I like yeah, that. I think that'd be very healthy for Dave, too. Dave is on mm -hmm. a healthy kick. So you know it. <laughs> yeah, it'll be a warm up for that burger. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, you say, well, this is a great recipe. Man, where can I find some of that great hemp seed oil at? Well, I'm glad you asked. That's, that's what we call a shameless plug, but go it, ahead. So. It's terrible. I know. Oh, you know something? <laughs> Wait a second. And you can see now the you got to have the hat. You got to go Hold with the hat. Hold on. I forgot to put on the hemp for hat. So let's get <laughs> on. 
All right. So anyways, we're going to carry this on the uh, on, on my website, donaldfarm.biz. That'll be coming out. And then uh, there are other many fine establishments throughout Michigan that will be carrying this. We've already got it in some of the stores right now. So we'll have that information as well up on down on the farm.biz where you can find it locally and we'll have that available. So is it on my side of the state? I'm in Southeast Michigan here. So. It will be, it will All be. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. I just got, got to get more. We're going to do a, a run of about 50 cases. So ah. I just got to get it run so we can get it out to everybody. Yep. Yeah, I've been using it cooking eggs and I, uh, we have an air fryer now and did some uh, French fries with it and some other things. So it was really well, good. That, is it, does it, Really, no, I've never no tried noticeable using difference. It. Does it add anything to the taste or anything, or not? No, no. no? Mm. Okay, it's just cool. Yep. <laughs> it's very good tasting. It's got that. It's got that earthy, uh, earthy lemony or earthy nutty flavor kind of to it. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. If you it's a dip, I would. I'm sure you would notice it like that for sure. Mm -hmm. right. yep. Very cool. Yeah. So that was a real simple, easy recipe that we had for that for today. So. <laughs> Hold your up. Oh, got to hold up. Oh, one more time. Okay, there we go. Yep. Oh, the label. You got to spin the label around. Spin the label. There yep. we go. There we go. There we go. Okay. Yep. All right. So that's really all I have today. Um, again, everybody, thanks for joining us right. today. Scott, thanks for giving us a world of information. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, do, we, do we know who we're going to have on the show next week, by the way? Uh, we don't know exactly who we would write a couple on. If not, we're going to cover it. Uh, but what we're going to talk about next week is, you know, some of the things that we need to talk about with our legislators since they're back home uh, for a recess for a while. We can get face to face. We're actually going to try to get um, maybe one or two of them on at some point so we can talk with them and fill them in on where our concerns are on things so that they're knowledgeable. It's all education, right? We've got to teach them what we need to have and why some of the things that we have already are not good for us you know we need to go from 0.3 percent to one percent or more right those kind of things so by educating them talking with them when they're home right now is an election year so they're going to promise yeah. us everything right <laughs> <That's> <laughs> indeed they will yeah they will yeah but anyways but we do need to do that education part so we're going to talk about how all of us whether you're a farmer a grower a processor um just a manufacturer whatever what we can do to keep moving this industry forward and keep getting, making it obtainable and reasonable so that we can all uh, make this industry grow and, and do stuff. Just like the hemp wood, just like my oil, right? So that kind of stuff. All right. So that's what we'll be on next week. And then the week after that, I think we're going to have women in hemp is our going to be our topic on, uh, right. on the 20th. So. Huh. Mm -hmm. All right. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. All right. Anybody wants to be a sponsor, hop online. It's not too bad. We have information up on the website. Thanks, everybody. All right, thanks. See you next week. Cool. Thanks, Scott.